Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Chelsea Kenyon from the uh, Kansas City Center Weather Service Unit uh, here at the Earth Job Center in the late night. And uh, with me is Sarah TV from the forecast office in Topeka. And uh, we have been working on local wind shear for quite a while. And we wanted to um, kind of talk about the differences between low level wind shear and low altitude turbulence. There's a lot of confusion about these two things, both from on the pilot side, I'm sure, as well as on the forecaster side. So we've been kind of uh, trying to create an effort to educate everybody about what the differences are between the two. We've had a lot of turnover in the uh, forecast ranks, and so there's a lot of new forecasters coming on that maybe have not really been talking very much about the level wind shear and, and how that different uh, how that differentiates from a uh, little turbulence and then for the pilots it's always kind of a bit of a confusion uh, so we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about those things uh first i wanted to start off with some statistics shared with me uh, from the ntsb if you were in Oshkosh this year you would have seen some of these uh, these are general aviation estimates for about roughly the last decade and you can see good news but it's kind of a slow decline on both the accident side and the fatality side but it's, it's a very slow decline through 2021 but when we look at GA and the uh, most frequent uh, weather-related findings, you can see that adverse winds really do cause the vast majority of the accidents. So gas, crosswinds, tailwinds, all of those things cause a lot of accidents, but you can see the fatality rates, the red bars, are pretty low. Um, you can see, if you look down toward IMC, those see things below VFR minimum, much higher fatality rate for those things. So that really is where most of the fatal accidents are occurring and also at IMC uh, low visibility, uh, also very high fatality rate, and also the light dark phenomenon can cause a lot of accidents as well and a high fatality rate. So even though winds are causing a lot more accidents, they're usually not fatal, which is great news. Um, if we break it down a little bit further, you can see just from, from 2008 till about 2020, uh, feeling visibility and precip have been over 75 percent fatality rate in GA. So that is really where most of the bad accidents are happening. And then convective weather is also over 65 or 65 percent. Uh, you know, big rate. So wind causes by far the most accidents, but they're not usually fatal. If we look a little bit deeper, um, so on the, the far right side there, the weather-related accidents for the total accidents, weather related is about 22 percent. Um, and you can see adverse winds causing a lot of that, feelings of visibility also causing a lot of that. We're talking about low level wind shear, very, very small, about 2% of all the accidents uh, that are that are caused from 2008 until 2020. And then if you look at fatalities specifically, um, you can see the wind shear is down 1%. So wind shear is not causing a lot of accidents. It's Figure out why that might be. And it's clearly not being driven by aircraft out. But it's good to know what is causing accidents. And really, IMC is probably the biggest one with the visibility. So that always needs to be where your attention needs to go first. But we're going to talk a little bit about wind shear, and then we'll break down uh, the little turbulence as well as the little wind shear. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Okay, thank you, Chelsea. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Good Okay, I think I think we're okay now. So we're going to move forward with this. Um, I'm going to get into low-level wind shear, and then we're going to talk about low-level turbulence and the difference between the two. Um, so you may be aware of kind of the general concept of shear. Shear um, and wind shear specifically is a change in the wind. Um, we're going to be talking about vertical wind shear, and so this is a change in the wind along a vertical axis. So it's as you go up into the atmosphere. 
we have a couple of different types of shear that we talk about from a meteorological perspective. We have directional shear, which is a change in wind direction with height. And we have speed shear, which you can probably deduce is a change in speed with height. Um, typically, in our standard atmosphere, you're going to see a combination of both occurring. Not always, but usually as you go up um, in a vertical direction, you're going to see a change in the wind speed usually increases with height because of less friction above the surface. And generally, you're going to see some kind of turning of the wind as well. So you have both speed and directional shear as you go up into the atmosphere. OK, just checking. OK, there we go. Um, so when we talk about low-level wind shear today, we're going to focus on two types. That's going to be convective low-level wind shear and non-convective. So as pilots, you probably are already aware that convection um, can cause a whole host of um, hazards for aviation. We're going to talk specifically about wind. Thunderstorms can produce their own low-level wind shear. We have a very complex field of wind that happens in and around thunderstorms, but what's most dangerous for pilots is um, these downdraft winds or downburst or even smaller scale microburst winds can be very dangerous. When you have a healthy thunderstorm, you have both an updraft, so you have air coming into that thunderstorm, and you have a downdraft, so you have air coming out of that thunderstorm. And when you have air accelerating from the storm toward the ground, as you can imagine, once it hits the ground, it is going to spread out in all directions. And so now you have what can be some intense uh, low-level wind shear around thunderstorms. A little bit more on convective hazards here. Um, you're going to see turbulence in and around thunderstorms, the low-level wind shear, which is what we were just talking a little bit about, gusty surface winds. You could have icing conditions within those cloud layers lightning, and then localized IFR conditions. And all of that is implied. When we have thunderstorms in the forecast, you can expect one or maybe all of those hazards to be associated with thunderstorms. And when we do have thunderstorms, um, as a pilot, you're going to see convective SIGMETs that are going to be issued by the Aviation Weather Center, or you may see the center weather advisories issued by the center weather service units, and then those can turn into the SIGMETs. When you look at your TAPs, you're also going to see the TS abbreviation standing for thunderstorms. You might see the VCTS, which is vicinity thunderstorms, meaning that we're expecting thunderstorms within about five miles of the airport or the prevailing TS group. You should also be aware that we have unstable air in and around showers as well. So if you have um, showers or vicinity showers or even Virga, which you're not going to see mentioned in the tap, but you can see that from the ground and sometimes from the air. Just assume that there's some unstable air associated with that as well. And like I mentioned earlier, thunderstorms are characterized by updrafts and downdrafts, and you can assume that there's going to be turbulence, shear, icing, um, and wind issues in and around, especially your stronger thunderstorms. So for low-level wind shear, your classic setup here is, is when we have an inversion. And this gives you a little bit of a schematic here about what, how, kind of how that inversion looks. And an inversion, as you may be aware, is an increase in temperatures with height. This typically happens at night or first thing in the morning. But so during the day, the, the sun warms the surface. And um, that warm layer of air near the surface is going to rise because warm air is less dense than cold air. And so you have air rising during the day, and you have good mixing of the atmosphere then typically during the afternoon. Well, then as the uh, sun angle starts to go down and we start to cool the surface, um, we have still a warm layer aloft, but the surface of the, the earth is going to cool a lot faster than the air above it due to long wave radiation being emitted from the surface. And so now you have um, a temperature inversion. And this doesn't happen every night. It really depends on the atmosphere. If you still have some pretty gusty winds, you still get some good mixing, and you maybe don't see this inversion set up. But typically on your calm nights in a dry atmosphere, we're going to get an inversion like this. And what we see then is this discontinuity um, near that inversion top. And so below that, we tend to have uh, cooler air, calm conditions, maybe light winds. And then as you reach that inversion top, that's when your winds could start to, to increase. And it could happen fairly abruptly. Here's what this might look like on a sounding or a forecast sounding. This one uses our buff kit software. You see that inversion, so the, the red line is the temperature line, and you see the temperature is warming a little bit with height. The winds near the surface are pretty light out of the south, about six to eight knots. But then once you reach that inversion top, which is really not very high off the ground here, maybe a thousand feet, but we don't have that label on there. But you see the winds are southwest at 42 knots. And you might encounter that pretty quickly when you get to that inversion top. You may see the winds increase fast, and that is your classic setup for low-level wind shear. 
So one more schematic here, we have this discontinuity layer, and that's the top of the inversion. So below that, we have light winds that can be decoupled from the winds above, okay, as opposed to during the day when we have good mixing of the low-level atmosphere. And then you're going to see your stronger winds above, and you could also have that directional shear with winds out of a different direction. One thing you really want to look for as a pilot to distinguish between low-level wind shear and turbulence is that when you experience low-level wind shear, you're going to see a sudden change in airspeed, a gain or a loss, not both. If you have both, you're dealing with turbulence. If you just have a gain or a loss, you are dealing with low-level wind shear. Okay, so that's gonna take us then into low-level turbulence and a little bit of the difference between the two. So for turbulence, this is also shear. You're seeing a change in wind that's causing bumpy conditions. Um, typically with turbulence, uh, this presents itself in the form of eddies or waves. It tends to be smaller in scale than low-level wind shear, um, and it also tends to be a little less organized. It also can develop a lot faster than low-level wind shear. In the case where we talked about the nocturnal inversion, that takes several hours for that to set up at night as the ground cools, but something like low-level turbulence can um, happen very quickly. And we have a lot of different atmospheric setups that can cause turbulence in the low levels. One of those is the low-level jet. We see this sometimes develop at night due to differential heating and cooling and an increase in the pressure gradient. We also see these low-level jets set up when we have strong storm systems developing out to the west, maybe near the Rockies. So we see this oftentimes over the plains when that is happening. And what is a, what is a jet? Um, as you can probably infer, a jet is just a fast ribbon of air. And you can pick these out pretty easily on uh, models or on weather charts. But here's an example. Um, over here on the right, this is the surface, and we have winds, you know, say around Kansas City out of the south, fairly light there. But then as you go up in the middle, we have 925 millibars. The winds are starting to increase. Again, less friction above, and at night, we have this differential heating and cooling and an increase in the pressure gradient. Then you go up to 850, which again is not a whole lot higher into the atmosphere, and our winds are a lot stronger at that point, 50 to 60 knots, and that is your low-level jet. So as you're flying up into that or you're coming in and out of a jet, you can seriously um, you can certainly experience a little bit of turbulence with that. Other causes, we're going to talk a little bit more about mechanical mixing and daytime heating in the next slide. But surface boundaries and fronts, where you have differing air masses, when you pass into those regions, you're going to have maybe a little bit of turbulence and some bumpy conditions. Also, gravity and mountain waves can cause that around mountains or hilly terrain. And strong surface winds are also going to cause some turbulence. So a little bit more on mechanical turbulence here. Um, at the surface, we have a lot of friction, right? We have a lot of trees, we have buildings, and the wind is going to work around those and cause eddies, okay? And so that's, that's, that's your small scale turbulence, but those eddies can be pulled downstream with the wind and you're gonna have a lot of bumpy conditions because of that wind working around the obstacles at the surface and because of the friction, okay? And then the thermals, this is when we have the surface heating during the day, um, that gets going in the morning and becomes more intense than by midday. And like we talked about earlier, the, the air near the surface is going to heat up and it's going to start to rise because it's less buoyant. And as it does that, you might encounter some of that rising air as thermals. And that's pretty common late in the morning, early afternoon. Maybe see less of that as the atmosphere is better mixed during the afternoon. But if you get above the cloud layers, um, you're going to have a much smoother ride there. So that really is the main difference um, between low-level wind shear and turbulence. I'm going to turn it back over to Chelsea now to talk about pilot. So pilot reports end up being sort of our ground truth. It's like a forecast office getting a tornado report from somebody. We know it happened. So this is the way that we verify our forecasts uh, for aviation. We have to use pilot reports. Well, the problem is sometimes pilot reports are not always correct. They're very subjective. It depends on the type of aircraft you're in and what you're experiencing. And so they all have to be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt. However, you can see we talked about the single change in the wind direction when you're experiencing low-level wind shear as opposed to coming from multiple directions. That's low-level turbulence. Well, we see that often with pilot reports. And so sometimes if a pilot is experiencing that kind of wind shear below 2,000 feet, they automatically assume it's low-level wind shear because it's below 2,000 feet. But if it's coming from multiple directions, that's actually turbulence. So we see this all the time with pilot reports, and I wanted to show a couple of different ones. So the first one there, um, it's low-level wind shear plus or minus 10 knots. It's probably the most common low-level wind shear report I see. 
and that's actually turbulence. Just because it occurs below 2,000 feet doesn't make it low-level wind shear. It's wind shear below 2,000 feet, but it's coming from multiple directions. That's actually turbulence. So if you were going to put that pi rep in, I would put turbulence in the turbulence field and then put plus or minus 10 knots and leave out the low-level wind shear uh, abbreviation, and that would be correct. Uh, same thing with the second one there, low-level wind shear minus 15 knots on short final. That actually is low-level wind shear. That one was put in correctly. The ones around Oklahoma City here, I did flag them. They should be urgent because of the, the magnitude. They're over 10 knots. But 25 knot gain, that's low-level wind shear. Uh, 15 knot plus short final, that's low-level wind shear. So those ones are actually correct. Um, then this Joplin one here at the bottom, plus or minus 10 knots. So that was actually uh, a bumpy day. It was uh, windy, and I actually pulled the surface observations from that time for that location. And you can see the wind gusts are 25 knots uh, going on right there. So even though they're reporting low-level wind shear surface to 100 feet during descent, um, it's actually turbulence that they're experiencing. So sometimes the pilot reports can lead us astray. So here's a day just not too long ago, actually, where we had a very windy day. We had a ton of low-level wind shear reports, and there, there were a lot of low-level turbulence reports as well. And I just kind of picked out a few of the ones in the blue are actually the low-level wind shear ones that are incorrect. And then we've got a couple here, uh, wind shear, this Chicago O'Hare 737 report. It's about two-thirds of the way down with the red at the end, plus or minus 20 knots. That's actually the correct way to de depict it. Um, low level wind shear plus 20 knots down here off of uh, Lafayette, um, Illinois. So you can see we've got, or I'm sorry, Indiana. So we've got a lot of reports. These are all low altitude turbulence reports and the wind shear reports mixed in. Yes. So if you're flying in turbulence, you know, you may not have time to be really fine. I mean, would, does Kansas City Center or whomever, does ATC, I know you work closely with them. Do they help correct this? I'm just saying we might say it wrong because we're bumping around. <laughs> sure, yeah. So the question is if you give your pi rep for turbulence to ATC, will they make sure that they put it in correctly? I can tell you probably not. Um, because the pot, you know, the controllers are also very busy and they're, you know, especially in the low altitude, they've got a lot of things to keep track of. So they're pretty much going to put in whatever you whatever you say. Um, hopefully when it gets to the, the flight data unit and they're the ones who are actually sending them out, that they will take a look at it, but I'm not sure that they're going to be QCing these either. So it's really, this is just part of the, part of the system we have. It's imperfect, but, um, absolutely, absolutely. You guys are getting jostled around out there. So just be aware, um, I, I did put the low level wind shear air met on here so you could see where that actually was forecast to be happening. And the new AWC uh, website, I don't know if you guys have played around with it yet, but uh, the new format for the low-level wind shear reports is kind of the little double squiggly lines. And you can see how many of them we were getting well outside of that, as opposed to closer to the air met, which is where we were actually expecting low-level wind shear. So um, we get a mixed bag to saying that pilot reports are not always definitive to help us verify the forecast. Sometimes you have to really break them down and look to see. So as pilots, when you're experiencing turbulence, if it's coming from multiple directions, it's turbulence. That's the biggest difference between the two. If it's a single gain or a single loss below 2,000 feet, then it's low level wind shear. So we just wanted to bring awareness to that. So if you have any further questions, we'll have a Q&A session here in a little bit, but if you do have further questions about this, and I, I'm sure uh, there are lots of questions, uh, Sarah and I are happy to answer your questions or